Welcome to this webinar, which is part of the Children's Policy Centre webinar series in conversation with Children's Commissioners. I'm Sharon Bessel. I'm a Professor of Public Policy in the Crawford School of Public Policy at the Australian National University, and I'm Director of the Children's Policy Centre. I'm in the south of Canberra on Ngunnawal land. This land has never been ceded, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and to all First Nations peoples who might be joining us for this webinar today. The Children's Policy Centre is based at the ANU, and we have three key objectives. First, to undertake innovative interdisciplinary research on a range of issues relating to children's policy. Second, to seek to connect researchers, policymakers, and practitioners working on a range of issues to promote the human rights, the well-being, and the best interests of children. And third, we aim to communicate research findings to contribute to better outcomes for children and for young people. And of course, this webinar series is central to the work that we do. Today's webinar is on prioritising the rights and the interests of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people. And I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Natalie Lewis. Natalie is Commissioner with the Queensland Family and Child Commission. And of course, in our webinar last week, we were joined by Natalie's colleague, Luke Twyford, and also Jodie Griffiths-Cook from the ACT, when we were talking about putting children at the centre. And the recording of that webinar is available on the Children's Policy Centre website. Natalie's career spans more than 25 years across youth justice, child and family services, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs. She was CEO of the Queensland Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Child Protection Peak for eight years, and she's held numerous appointments on boards and councils that have driven significant reform in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child protection and family services sectors. And Natalie was also co-chair of the Family Matters campaign, which was such, uh, has been produced such important work. Natalie is fiercely committed to progressing a transformational agenda of reform to ensure that children's rights are upheld in Queensland and nationally. And I can think of no one better to be talking with us about prioritising the rights and interests of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people. Natalie, it's so good to have you with us. Um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just let our audience know that there will be time for questions and comments. Um, if you do have a question, please pop it in the Q&A and I'll ask people to use the Q&A rather than the chat um, because I don't often see what's happening in the chat. There's sometimes a lively side conversation happening there. So please use the Q&A. But Natalie, in we, as, as we begin these, these conversations and we've had um, webinars now with a number of your colleagues across um, states and territories um, in Australia, it's been striking that the role that commissioners plays is often different from one another across jurisdictions. And I wonder if we could begin by asking you to just outline your role and the kinds of issues that you have responsibility for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Um, I just want to um, just start off by saying um, um, I'm a Gimalura Yinam and um, I am therefore a guest on the country of the Yagra and Turrbal people um, here in Mianjin, in Brisbane. I want to just pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, but also importantly, I want to acknowledge the lived experiences um, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children right across this country, uh, because that's what gives collective meaning to the, to the work that we all do. Um, so as a Children's Commissioner um, here in, in Brisbane, um, we have a slightly different arrangement um, and role than um, a number of the other jurisdictions. Um, so we are an independent statutory body. Uh, we have responsibility for oversight um, of um, a suite of reforms that was uh, that are known as the Carmody reforms um, that resulted from the Child Protection Commission of Inquiry up here in 2013. Um, you know, so we, um, we look at um, child protection reform broadly, um, because, you know, reform is never um, static. There are always new issues, um, but we have a very explicit um, oversight function um, and additional functions like monitoring, um, you know, the Queensland Child Death Register um, and looking at that data to see if there are trends um, emerging um, and then trying to be on the, so I guess, the front board in, in advocating for preventative strategies um, to try and, um, you know, prevent 
um, deaths of children. And also um, the Child Death Review Board was established. And while it's not part of the commission, it's sort of set up as, um, you know, under the auspice of the commission, it has its own independence. It's chaired by our principal commissioner. Um, and that board has responsibility for reviewing um, the deaths of children and young people that were known to uh, child safety in the 12 months prior to their death. So, um, so they conduct systemic uh, reviews and engage with all of the agencies um, that have had a role um, or interaction in the lives of those children um, to understand what the situation was and what might be um, able to be uh, put in place to try and prevent a repeat. So, yeah, so I think um, it's, it's, it's a little bit different. We don't have a, a complaints function. Um, which is very different than a number of the other jurisdictions. Um, and our focus is very squarely on um, systemic issues. Um, and I think that the you know, million dollar question is how many individual experiences or issues does it take to constitute a, a systemic issue? So, so I think that that line, that point where we intervene sort of moves, um, sometimes it feels like daily, um, but I think that um, you know, systemic issues are, that, um, you know, that translation of the lived experience of individual children. And um, so we, we need to take that very seriously. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Natalie. And, and we, we want to talk about some of those systemic issues and how the work that you've been doing is, is contributing to reform when we think about prioritising the rights and wellbeing of, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people. Mm -hmm. but, but before we, we do that, I wonder if we could just begin by talking about the place that children have in Aboriginal and Torres Strait, Strait Islander communities. And I wonder if you can share with us a little bit about children's place in community, in culture, in country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the well-being of our children is inextricably like tied to their connection to kin, to country and to culture. So that place is established through their relationships to kin and country um, and their experience of culture is sort of sustained through those relationships, through the lessons that are learned and the stories that are shared. Um, but through our, our having, um, you know, a shared ancestry, a shared history, and that shared responsibility for cultural continuity, I think one of the most beautiful expressions in terms of, um, you know, uh, the place for children in, um, in, in our communities um, was in the, uh, uh, in the Women's Voices report, Ani June said that um, our young ones um, who are the hol next holders of our knowledges and when we invest in them, they can dance and sing a vibrant and healthy future into being. And, um, and I think for me that captures the essence and the, um, the beauty of our children and the, and the significance of them um, in our current um, and, and in our future. I think that's such a beautiful way to, to think about um, you know, children's place in, in society broadly. And you know, if, if we can create systems where children can dance and sing and be included, mm. what a better world we'd have. You know, mm. it's it's such a powerful message. Yeah. yeah. But um, Natalie, I, I I wanted to move on to you know some of the more challenging areas that that you're working on and where you're trying to bring about the kind of transformation and reform that's that's needed. And of course, we, we know from the statistics across this country that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people are overrepresented in child protection systems. You know, that's, that's across all jurisdictions, including Queensland. Yeah. The Child and Family uh, Commission um, identifies this as the greatest challenge and the greatest contemporary injustice that, that we see in this country. And Queensland is the first, and I think to date the only jurisdiction to implement all five elements of the Torres Strait Islander child placement principle. Mm -hmm. Can you talk us through that principle, its five elements and, and yep. how you're going about implementing it? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I believe as of today, I think we still might be the only has, um, jurisdiction that has legislated it, but I think South Australia is pretty close. And um, and I, I did get a look at the bill and um, and and I think that it's, it's actually um, strengthened um, the child placement principle in the way that it's been presented. So I think that would be a real um, benefit um, in South Australia. So I guess the, the purpose, um, 
um, is, is that it operates as a, a safeguard for the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people and their families that are interacting with the statutory child protection system. Um, so everyone is fairly familiar, I'm, I'm sure, that you know, for um, you know, more than a decade um, in our legislation, we had um, what was known as the Child Placement Principle, which was um, one dimensional. It was effectively a, a, a placement hierarchy, um, which was sort of listed off the you know, preferred options about where an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander child should be placed. So I guess that you know, there was an under, underlying goal around um, cultural continuity and connection. Um, but the sad thing, I think the disappointing thing is that it, in practice, what that meant is practitioners were only required to think about an Aboriginal child's cultural continuity or their right to connection um, only after the decision had been made to remove them from their family. And so um, there was a whole series of work, a whole range of people that have been involved um, in, in, in promoting this sort of idea around a multidimensional um, um, interpretation of the child placement principle for a long time. So people like um, Claire Tilbury, um, you know, partnering with Snake to do some really incredible work in 2012. And, and I guess the outcome of that was that we were, it was communicated that there were these five constituent elements um, and those elements being prevention, participation, partnership, placement and connection. And together, they do operate as a safeguard for the broader rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. So if we think about prevention, that's about saying, have these children, young people and their families, have they got equitable access to the quality supports, so universal um, services and targeted supports that they need in order for children to stay safe at home? So it's a really important question that sometimes isn't isn't asked or isn't prompted. And I think having that within the legislation to um, guide decision-making um, is, is critically important. Um, the second element is, is, is participation. And, and that really is about giving practical effect to the right of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, young people, their families, community members um, to participate in the decisions that are made about them. They're, they are most profoundly affected by those decisions. So it, it, it makes sense, you know, um, not just, you know, through a rights lens, um, but to participate in those decisions is going to generate a better outcome, one that is far, far more closely aligned with the needs and the aspirations of that family. Um, the partnership element really focuses on the role of community controlled organisations um, in, in working collaboratively, um, you know, with families within the context of their communities to actually um, deliver services and perform functions that have for a long time, I guess, been the sole domain of the statutory child protection system. The placement element is that hierarchy of preferred placement options um, and connection um, as an element of the child placement principle is just that stark reminder that children have a right to cultural continuity. That means meaningful and sustained connection to family members, to, um, you know, to their siblings, to their aunts, uncles, cousins, to the communities that care for them um, and to whom they belong. So I think that having that as, as a reference point, um, more than a reference point actually, um, but to guide every single significant decision that is made in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children across the continuum of child protection is, um, yeah, I think that, you know, was a really uh, positive step um, you know, and a sort of a signal of some progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so fundamentally important and it's it's comprehensive. And that was such a, a, a fantastic expl explanation of that principle, because I think very often the focus is around the placement principle, you know, mm -hmm. or the, the placement component rather than everything else that, that makes up a much broader approach. And Natalie, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on you know, that idea of, of prevention. And of course, if we can prevent any child from ending up in the child protection system or particularly in out of home care, mm -hmm. then that's the best outcome for the child, for their family, for their community very often. Um, yeah. How close are we to really seeing that principle of pre prevention being put in place in a meaningful way. And of course, this goes across jurisdictions, across state and, yep. and federal responsibility. But, you know, I see in the work that I do, you know, so often in terms of income, you know, mm -hmm. families don't have sufficient income, but in terms of access to quality healthcare, 
to dental care, to inclusive education, you know, and you can just go on and on. We're, we're yeah. still a long way away. But I'd really love to hear your assessment of how yeah. we're progressing towards really ensuring that access to, to services and those supports are in place. Yeah. Um, look, I, I, look, I'm going to acknowledge there has been some significant progress in Queensland. Um, there's been a lot of attention paid to trying to recalibrate um, you know that that ratio of investment in the into preventional intervention and um, the tertiary system, um, but I think one of the struggles is a lot of the investment in that um, in the context of the child protection system that is focused around prevention. Um, I think really by virtue of um, you know scope of the legislation, but also just um, available resources has really focused on prevention of entry into the child protection system, as opposed to prevention of harm, um, inequity, and just, you know, a whole range of things. And, and to, be, to be real, those things sit outside of the locus of control of child protection systems. And so there's this reluctance, I think, um, you know, for um, other parts of the broader service system um, to really, see themselves as duty bearers, as having a responsibility and, and recognising that that failure to address the inequity in terms of experiences around stable housing for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, around um, you know, poverty, availability of quality and culturally safe mental health supports, a whole range of things that are absolutely important um, you know to the safety and well-being of families and of communities are simply not accessible for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in different parts of Queensland um, um, and I think that it's um, I think until there's that recognition that creating cult creating communities of care means that schools need to step up, early childhood services need to step up. Um, there needs to be, um, you know, fundamental shifts in the way that we understand how we respond to intergenerational trauma. Um, we need to have people be able to access um, services around substance misuse if they've put their hand up and said, this is something that I need support with. Um, those things when left unaddressed impact on the safety of children. And that then brings them to the attention of the child protection system, which is ill-equipped to provide the types of sort services to transform the, the experience of disadvantage of families. And so I, you know, I, I really just think that part of part of what we're trying to advocate is a recognition um, around children being rights holders um, and, and for all of government, all service providers, all adults that interact in the lives of children and young people are duty bearers. And so it is not good enough um, to flick past responsibility to sit at, you know, at the gate of um, the child protection system nor at the feet of vulnerable families. So yeah, that's what we need to, Focus on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, Atty, I, I was um, involved in a, a webinar um, for Anti Poverty Week last year, um, and one of the speakers on the panel was talking, you know, in talking about child poverty, and of course in Australia across the board, one in six children are, are living in income poverty, and he made the point that allowing um, through policy decisions allowing children to live in poverty is a form of state abuse. Yeah. And that if we're really going to think seriously about protecting all children, we need to think of the kinds of abuse that are perpetrated by the state against children through yeah. policies that don't support their interests and well-being, and you know, particularly around poverty. And I thought that was such a powerful way of framing it because it begins to shift the, the responsibility and the duty away from parents who are often doing their very, very best in really difficult circumstances and who love their children deeply mm. towards the kinds of policy failures mm. that are creating some of those, um, some of those drivers yeah. that see children ending up in the, in the child protection system. Mm. So I thought that was yeah, a really interesting way of, of starting to think about it, which does shift the focus of who the duty bearer is. Yeah. And it's, and, and, you know, the issue of, of poverty, like is, is, incredibly important if we think about the majority of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and families that are interacting with child protection systems is by virtue of neglect, like, and you know, on the basis of neglect, which is 
Absolutely. You can't disentangle that from experiences of intergenerational poverty. And so I think that, um, yeah, it, it absolutely has a, a, a space, you know, um, I, I wish that there was that the discussions around um, addressing child poverty in this country were more central, more uh, more um, common part of the discourse, um, because um, in the absence of that, we focus on bad parents and we end up with this weird, you know, discussion continually about these constructs of like what is a good parent and what is a bad parent. And um and I and that is so incredibly unhelpful and that is harmful, you know, to children. So um so yeah, I would certainly uh love to see a much more deliberate and um intentional focus around child poverty um and its and its role in child treat maltreatment and neglect. Yeah. I, I know in some of the research that I've done um, with, with children who are in ex either experiencing poverty or, or who have experienced or are experiencing out-of-home care, you know, the parents who are sometimes labelled as bad parents mm -hmm. are actually extraordinary parents exactly. <laughs> when you think about the, the context that they're dealing with and what they're trying to do to support mm -hmm. and, um, and, and look after and do the best for their children mm -hmm. with no resources and no support. And often, you know, a, a, a context of shame and stigma are being um, put on them constantly. And I think, you know, they're, they're extraordinary parents who need support rather than, mm. than blame. Yeah. Natalie, you, you talked about, um, or you, you mentioned then um, intergenerational trauma. And I think this is something that is often just either absent from, absent from or completely misunderstood in some of the narratives um, around. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and their communities, and particularly when we think about issues of child protection or, or indeed youth justice. Would you be able to just talk a little bit more about how intergenerational trauma plays out, but how we need to think differently um, in supporting people who have had those experiences over generations mm -hmm. as a result of um, you know, the, the, the nature of the the white settler community in Australia and and in many parts of the country as a result of genocide. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, if we you know we think about you know the impacts of colonization. I think what's happened is it's been tied. It, it's been packaged up into this tiny set of words, right? That are that are referenced whenever whenever we talk about overrepresentation, but we never actually delve into what is what that actually means and what are the implications, you know, for children and families today. So I think there's, you know, there's, there's, you know, always some passive acknowledgement around, oh, you know, the impacts of intergenerational trauma and of past policies and, 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 but when do we stop and say, are they past policies or, or do we see remnants of those practices and policies in, in the way that um, systems interact with our families today? Um, you know, uh, is uh, colonial violence a, a thing of the past? Mm, well, it's hard to convince people of that when you actually see evidence of that playing out on TV screens in terms of, you know, violence, police violence against um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I, th I think there's so many of these um, glimpses on our, you know, in, in the media um, and in our contemporary um, narrative um, that are not very different than the experiences um, from a very long time ago. So I think that it's hard, you know, you hear people say, oh, you know, they need to get on, get over it and they need to move on. Well, we're seeing evidence of the same types of behaviours and the same types of hazardous good intentions play out in the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and families. So it's a bit difficult, you know. I think that the other, the other issue is that, you know, there are incredible um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander professionals and and um, and thought leaders who have absolutely been able to communicate what trauma, uh, what intergenerational trauma is, what we need to do about it, but. I, I feel like we don't pay nearly enough attention to it. I, I think that we need to position the types of 
um, you know, the thinking and, and the, you know, the recommendations and the way forward presented by people like Dr. Tracy Westerman, by Dr. Helen Milroy, um, by the Healing Foundation. Um, and, you know, the thing that's sim that, that is really consistent across all of, um, all of those contributions from like incre largely incredible Aboriginal women um, is this thing called truth telling. And I think that is the thing that our, more, our society more generally is disinclined to do. So it's uncomfortable, it's difficult. It means, you know, um, yeah, it means co contemplating the experience of others and confronting the truth of our, our country's past and that's inconvenient for the majority. So I think that that's one of the things that prevents us from embracing those lessons um, and, and listening to our experts um, to actually guide the way forward. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> Matthew, that's that's such a powerful way of, of, of kind of explaining it. And I think until we do start to have those truthful conversations, we, we can't move on. None of us can move on from mm -hmm. the legacies of the past. So it's, you know, it's so important. Um, and it's so important that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Islander leaders take us forward on that journey and, and, and lead the way. Um, Nadia, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the rights voices um, and stories and our rights matter projects that, that the commission has been doing. Um, and these are really powerful um, projects that have been led by the commission's young researchers in some cases, I think. Mm -hmm. Can you just tell us a little bit about what you've been doing in terms of engaging with children and young people about their experiences um, of the child protection system? Yeah. Yeah, I, look, I'm I'm happy to talk about this, um, you know, this piece of work and a whole range of um, the work that the QSCC has been doing. Um, I think that we've made a really conscious effort um, to using a rights-based approach in the work um, that we do um, and, and that we really take seriously the guiding principles of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, one of those being, um, you know, the views um, of, of children and young people. And I think that one of, I think what we are starting to see more and more across the organisation is that um, all of the work that we do actually is centred around you know, the lived experience and the aspirations of the children and young people who experience that particular issue, whatever it is that, you know, we're what, that we're um, looking at. And so Rights Voices Stories is, um, um, was a piece of work where it was truly led by young people, um, not accessorised by young people, not a, not sort of this passive collaboration. Um, there were 11, uh, there are 11 young people with a lived experience um, who we uh, employed um, and their job was to lead this piece of work. Our, our job was to support them, was to be comfortable with sort of stepping back and just providing the type of, you know, safe spaces and the resources that were required for the young people to truly lead um, that particular piece of work. And it was important for us because as an oversight body, we, um, we look at the performance of, for example, the child protection system. And while there's plenty of data that's available that tells us, you know, about the performance of the system in terms of throughput, you know, we can, we can look at data and it'll tell us about demand and, you know, how many kids are with um, family members. Um, but nothing that really communicates to us or answers the question, are children safe and well? And, and I think that um, it is up to the children and young people who have that lived experience of, this, of that system to tell us what is meaningful for them so that we can, as an oversight body, start to measure what matters um, as opposed to producing reports that talk about throughput um, and, and speak in this, you know, in, in the context of indicators that tell us nothing about the lived experience of the children in that system. So, so um, we, yeah, so I guess, you know, they've, they produced um, the report, which I'm sure someone will be able to put up on um, in the chat. Um, but importantly, they also then developed a, um, a framework called Our Rights Matter. Um, and so what they've been able to do is, is identify some key issues. So looking at identity, stability, health and well-being, feeling safe and loved um, and equity and fairness. Um, and 
in that framework, um, so that the next iteration, sorry, the next iteration from that framework is to continue to engage with the decision makers that have influence over those particular domains and, and work with them to actually develop a set of um, metrics that will allow us to communicate um, you know, how well the system is doing in terms of their experience of identity around stability on terms that mean something to the young people in the system, health and well-being on their terms, feeling safe and loved, you know, um, and communicating that in ways that matter. So um, I think, yeah, that it, that's, a, I think, a really important piece of work, but it's, um, yeah, it's not over. It, like, that, it, it actually can't be over. So, so really, our, our role is to support that group of um, youth researchers, um, you know, to a point where they feel the work is done um, and then they'll turn it on us and, and it'll provide an accountability measure for us as a, as a commission to demonstrate just how truly committed we are to focus on the rights of children and young people. Yeah. It's, it's a huge piece of work, but it's the mm. kind of work that could be genuinely transformational. And that's, mm. I think, really, really exciting. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the things when I've read about that work is, um, the shift towards an outbase comes approach. Yeah. Is, is it those metrics that are trying to lead you towards the outcomes-based approach or how are you thinking about that in terms of outcomes? Yeah, you know, it's funny because I think that, um, you know, this the argument to move towards outcomes-based measurement is not new, right? Everyone, you know, people, I think, have been saying that for decades. Um, but, you know, I think many of us adults I won't include you guys in this but I know certainly for me you get you hit this point where it just becomes so incredibly hard and you think oh well how do we actually do this you know um with a system that's so so set you know on those types of on the types of measures that they have and um but what I absolutely love about the approach that um these this group of young people have taken is um they're not there yet they're not as cynical or as jaded as some of us are and and they believe that that those outcomes can be measured they can be named they can be counted and they can be communicated in a way that um that um resonates with their experience or tells some you know um yeah I, and I think that the, their belief that that can happen and then us actually being prepared to not be the experts and sit in the room and listen to them explain to us what that outcome measure is and where we, they think we could get that information from um, and then getting out of the way and letting them go get those answers. And, you know, um, and, and I think that yeah, they've been able to do it. And I'm really looking forward to that next um, phase where, you know, they can get those commitments from people in decision-making positions to commence measurement and reporting on the outcomes that they've prescribed. And I think that that's, um, yeah, that's pretty exciting. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's really amazing. Um, and really, as I said, really transformational. And Natalie, are you at the point yet of, of starting to see the children's experiences are changing as a result of this work? Or is it still a bit early to be able to to see those changes playing out. Mm. Yeah, look, I'd, I'd, I'd say it's um, it's probably a little bit early. Um, there's, you know, there's there's these, you know, these these pieces of work that we do, um, but there's also, you know, the the sort of focused oversight pieces. Um, for example, principal focus work that's looking at overrepresentation. Um, so there have been a lot of reforms um, in Queensland. Um, that that point in time where we see the intent of the legislation evident in practice every single day is we haven't reached that point yet. Um, but in saying that, I think that we we have the legislation um, that's required. Um, I think that we have the commitment that's required. I think there's, a, you know, the um, Queensland was also um, the first jurisdiction to commit to a generational strategy to eliminate overrepresentation. Um, um, that was, you know, based on the building blocks of the Family Matters campaign. Um, there are things in place in, in terms of our legislative reform that happened in 2017, for example, to introduce this concept of delegated authority, which is, you know, moves us away this sort of passive notion of cultural awareness of systems, you know, being the, you know, the, um, the benchmark to actually saying, no, no, it's cultural authority. 
let's you know what I mean let's let's move towards this notion of cultural authority which is only ever vested in the families and communities that we're making decisions about. So I think that um, things like delegated authority, which actually enables the chief executive to, um, to delegate any of the functions and powers under the Child Protection Act to a community, a CEO of a community controlled organization um, to make those decisions in their place. And I think that, um, you know, um, it's, it's been a couple of years, it's probably been slower than many people would like, but we're starting to see that build momentum. And so, and where, we've, where we're seeing those examples of delegated authority being implemented, we are seeing much higher rates of participation of children and young people and their families in the decisions made about them. We're seeing much higher rates in terms of um, being able to identify appropriate kinship options for children who apparently for the last three to five years didn't have any family to be found. Um, we're seeing much greater opportunity for safe reunification um, of children as a result of changing who makes the decision. It's not changing the threshold. It's not lowering the standard and saying you know, we're now you know, deprioritizing safety. Absolutely not. Um, but what we're seeing is that by shifting the recognition that sometimes the department is not best placed to make decisions in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, recognizing that and handing that power over to Aboriginal organizations and people that are entrenched in and invested in their communities that are gonna be there long after the funding runs out, um, that is a sensible move and it is a great practical demonstration of self-determination in action. So when those things become the norm, not the exception, that's when I think we'll start to see, um, yeah, some, some measurable, differences in the experiences of our kids and families. I think those changes are, are just so important. And, you know, I think again about the research that I've done with, with children and young people um, who've experienced care, both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, but, but also non-Indigenous children. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they talk about is how impersonal the decisions that are made about their lives feel to them. Because when those decisions are made within a bureaucracy, you know, children feel completely disconnected and the possibility for them to participate in those decisions is often really narrow or it's on the terms of the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. I think these shifts are just so important in recognising how much connection and community and personal relationships matter to children and how much those things are essential if children are going to be fully supported mm -hmm. and able to participate and, and share their views. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just going to remind people that um, if to use the Q&A, if there are any questions, please do feel um, able to join the conversation if you'd like to, and if you'd like to raise any questions, or if you want to put your hand up, I will do my best to unmute you so you can answer the, ask Natalie a, a question yourself if you'd like to. Um, there's just a comment from Emma that's been put into the Q&A. So not a question, but, but a comment saying, I agree. Um, the state has a role in perpetuating the neglect of children. Um, and Emma points out that high rates of suspension and exclusion from school is another harm towards children that constitutes neglect. Yeah. So, um, mm. Natalie, no, I, 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 I agree more. Well, yeah. <laughs> did, did you want to comment more on that, Natalie, or pick up on that? It's, it's a, um, such an important point. Yeah, look, I think that um, that, that issue um, around um, the use of, um, in Queensland, you know, the, we refer to them as um, disciplinary absences, so around suspensions, exclusions, um, you know, that that has really um, been in sharp focus for us in the work that we're doing in the youth justice space. Um, so, you know, we, we certainly see um, that our children, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in the state of Queensland um, are subject to those types of measures um, much younger, much more often. Um, and that in the and entrenching those behaviors, um, sorry, those um, that disengagement from school, um, particularly in circumstances where it's not of the child's choice, it's because it's been a decision made of the education system. Um, in, in our taking a, a rights-based approach to our work, you can't ignore that fundamentally every child has a right to a quality education. Um, and so the exercising of those authorities that, have, that, that effectively absolve the Department of Education of providing that education um, 
is certainly something that we, you know, that we've got a keen interest in, um, and and it's not um, sufficient to um, to rationalise those types of decisions, or particularly that disproportionate use of those punitive measures um, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children um, on individual incidences of of behaviour, particularly when those children are also less likely to have access to appropriate diagnosis um, and access to support to help them, you know, to address issues so that, um, you know, that education um, isn't terrifying or alienating for them, um, but also um, being prepared to, um, you know, being prepared to acknowledge that um, particular approaches to education aren't going to meet the needs of every single child. And we need to be prepared to demonstrate some flexibility and imagination in how we deliver or, you know, we deliver on that promise on that ride of an education for all children. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's probably what I'll say. Mm -hmm. it, it's such a, yeah, it's a great point that Emma raised. And Natalie, how do we need to think about cultural safety at school? Are, are we giving enough attention to that that idea of cultural safety or, and how do we need to think about it? Um, <clears throat> I think that, um, in, in, look, look, I think it's, it's a lot easier for kids to engage in schools where they see reflections of themselves, you know, where they see that there are, um, that the things that matter to them, um, the things that they value are not just visible in the paintings that are hung up, um, you know, on the walls of the school, but that there is some investment in truth telling, understanding the history, recognising the people, um, you know, um, of place, wherever the school is located. Um, thinking about the importance of language and the benefit that it delivers, not just for cultural continuity and connection for our kids, but the benefit that that delivers in terms of the enrichment of lives of all students in this country. Those types of things can absolutely um, be achieved. Um, they're not beyond our imagination or our ability. Um, and I think that if we really want to make a commitment um, to quality, culturally affirming um, education, then we can't go past some of those initial steps. Hmm. Natalie, I, I wanted to talk a, a little bit about um, the youth justice system. Mm -hmm. And like, as, as in the child protection system, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children uh, are seriously overrepresented in the youth justice system. Mm -hmm. And I'm really keen to hear your thoughts on what we need, how, we, how the youth justice system needs to change in order to support the well-being and the rights of, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people. Um, that's a massive question, of course, <laughs> but, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on where we need to start and whether you're, you're seeing any progress in terms of us moving in the right direction. Um. It, um, I don't, okay, how do I answer this in a helpful way? Um, okay, so I think in terms of youth justice, um, one of the things that we have to do is we have to get past um, this notion that youth justice is about one portfolio or one particular department. Um, because the number of issues or the experiences of children and young people that enter the formal youth justice system have been visible to and largely ignored by many other parts of systems that are that exist to support um, children and young people. And so when we somehow think that the formal statutory youth justice system is the best place to take notice of and respond to children that have experienced family violence for years, children that have not got um, you know, safe and stable accommodation, children that have been disengaged from education for years on end. Like those types of things are the responsibilities of departments and broader communities outside of that formal youth justice system. And unfortunately, whenever we have conversations about you know, youth crime waves and all of those types, Type of things, we inevitably end up um, looking at punitive responses that are largely about incarcerating children and young people um, and prioritising the notion of community safety. We forget the fact that those kids are part of a community too that they're entitled to safety, that part of that experience that they've had of being disengaged, rejected or not 
safe in within their communities contributes to offending behavior. So I think that um, it's unhelpful to just think about a youth justice system because it leads us down a path which is inevitably not in the best interests of children and young people. And um, and in, even in terms of in the pursuit of you know, a goal around community safety, it is short lived um, because the reality is we are not addressing the needs. The, the system is not equipped, the youth justice system is not well equipped to meet the multiplicity of needs of children and young people. Um, and so we should be, unsurprised when they leave that system and are no less needing, you know, um, are, are no more safe, are no less hungry, are no less homeless. So I think unless we actually focus um, the attention where it needs to be um, in identifying and upholding, you know, the rights that our children have before their interaction with the youth justice system, particularly in terms of exclusions, um, because, that disengagement from school, so early entrenched patterns of truancy or disengagement from school is the most reliable indicator for long-term youth justice involved system involvement. So for me, that's a very important point on the continuum to address if we actually wanna do anything about the overrepresentation of our kids in, in the youth justice system. You know, and I'm hearing you talk Natalie and, and it, it seems to me that we, need to perhaps focus in a little differently on that idea of justice yeah. and when we're talking about youth justice maybe the starting point needs to be to ask what are the injustices that have brought that particular child to this point mm. um, and by thinking about about injustice in a systemic way it, it might start to address you know those really critical issues that you're that you're talking about absolutely there are a couple of comments in, or a comment and a question. So Bernadette has, has, has um, put in the Q&A that yes, we're being reactive, not proactive. We need a better interagency response, including local councils, schools and health. Um, and I'll, I'll go to a, a question from Emma who, who asks, how do we bring the broader community along in coming together to support and to grow up all children and young people? Mm, gosh, um, I think that's a great question, but again, it's a, a big question. question. And I think that, um, yeah, I, I think one of the complications is that um, sometimes it's, sometimes in some situations, it's, um, it's the inability to see our kids as part of that community. You, do you know what, and, and so, with the same expectations of safety, the same, you know, the same, um, you know, rights to go to school, the, the, you know, the same right to have places to play, you know, without ways of accessing support without surveillance. Like these are the types of impediments for, you know, inclusive communities, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to our kids. And so, um, I, you know, can I, can I just say one of the other really, really, really critical things that we are trying to address is that, in trying to curate a just outcome, you know, when in, in, in the issue of youth crime, the people who are most impacted are often the people that are left out of the conversation, and that is children and young people themselves. So in our work in the youth justice space, um, we are undertaking direct conversations, culturally safe conversations with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people that are currently involved in the youth justice system because there's so much um, so much of the narrative is controlled by um, other parties so whether it's you know people that are vocal on Facebook or you know or you've got um, you know the media obviously police union like there's a whole range of people that have got that have held a space in this story um, and it's been all about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. Let's not get it twisted. We are so grossly overrepresented in that in, in the statutory system. Um, but yet, no real interest in talking to them about what would make a difference. Like, how do we, you know, how do we meet their needs? And so vilifying Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children um, in that way, particularly through the, you know, um, the public discourse um, is, is clearly an impediment to seeing them as part of our communities and worthy of 
safety and you know and rights and justice so um so in that work um our hope is to um focus on those conversations with young people so they can communicate to us what makes a difference you know for them what are the what are their aspirations like what works what doesn't work um and and i think that anything that comes of that work um will faithfully communicate their aspirations and their ideas um, and will not be swayed by, um, you know, sort of blurring the focus um, and trying to meet the needs of um, a whole range of other stakeholders at the same time. Um, so, yeah, my, my interest is what are the right impacts on the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children of the recent reforms in Queensland, um, for example. So I think the only way for us to understand what those impacts are is to ask the kids that are affected. So that's what we're doing. And it's so great that you are doing it. I think, you know, you talked about the, the, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and there's so much in that convention that's really important, but that Article 12 around young people being able to express their views on matters affecting them and to have those views taken seriously mm -hmm. remains the most transformative principle, I think, within that yeah. convention. And um, you know, and gives the mandate for doing the kind of work that you're doing, and it is so important. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a question from, from Casey um, who asked, Nat, what do you see as more important, greater cross-sector systems collaboration or each sector to own responsibility to uphold children's rights? Mm. It's another tricky question, isn't it? You know, where does yes. responsibility sit and does that kind of almost mainstreaming take responsibility away from, from some sectors. It's, mm. it's a real challenge. It is, and it's an unsurprising question from Casey, can I say. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I, look, I think the first, the first step is around that um, recognition of children as rights holders um, and all adults and all you know, um, government departments as duty bearers. Um, I think there's a lack of clarity and a lack of willingness to actually embrace that role um, or that recognition that you're obliged to provide something, that there are entitlements for children and young people over which a number of different systems have exercised some controls. So first of all, it's recognition that there, there's a duty owed, right? And, and then, um, the collaboration across there. We talk about like collaboration all of the time, you know, um, but it seems to be this thing that we can never really um, do well enough, you know, um, because the next problem emerges and everyone says, oh, it's because there's no information sharing and because, you know, there's a siloed approach and people don't work together. So the thing for me is if, if there are individual, if there is recognition across a range of responsible um, agencies, so for example, health, education, um, you know, housing, that understand the obligations that they have at international law um, for upholding the rights of children, um, I think they there should be then an expectation, whole of government, that they're taking taking active steps to make good on those commitments and on those obligations to children, and that there's some accountability for it. That there is some measure of um, um, every year how well every government department is doing in advancing and upholding the rights of um, of children in Queensland and. Um, um, yeah, I think that the QFCC is probably very well positioned to start to introduce some of those accountability mechanisms beyond our traditional, you know, um, areas of influence, which is, you know, limited to the child protection system and the youth justice system. Um, but we certainly have an interest and I think um, a responsibility as an independent statutory body, particularly one who claims to be focused on children's rights, um, to, you know, to introduce more stringent accountability. Um, yeah. I'm just going to read a comment from Casey, which is, thanks, Nat. That's a great answer. Love your work. And I think, yeah, absolutely love your work, Nat. It's mm -hmm. amazing stuff you're doing. There's, and there's also a, a question um, in the Q&A from Charmaine, which is, is another great question. As an Indigenous educator, how can I influence mindset changes within the department and individual schools to start to address that children and young people are rights holders mm -hmm. and how they need to have their voices heard? 
Oh my goodness. Um, You're getting well, some really it, tough it, questions. Is, no, it is, a t- you know, it is, it is a tough question, but I think, you know, some of the stuff I try to, um, you know, I, sometimes I, you know, try to contemplate like, why is there such um, resistance to like embrace this idea of children as rights holders and to really um, give effect to our obligations under the UNCRC? And, and, you know, I think sometimes maybe the language, you know, um, people say is, you know, a little bit can be polarizing, it can be complicated, it can be all of these things. But um, when you break it all down, the thing that I love about using rights as a framework, it's this point of agreement. It's this thing, who would argue that all children have, you know, a right to have their voices heard. Like, who would argue that all children have a right to be safe and live free from violence? That they've got a right to an education. That if they're unwell, they get health they get access to health services. These are not like contentious. These these things aren't you know aren't particularly challenging. So maybe part of the trick about influencing everyday people, you know, within particular contexts, like in, you know, in education, maybe it's about cutting through the discourse and, you know, the sort of complication of the language and just reminding us at our, you know, at our core, the things that we're committed to for kids. Like, I think, um, and then finding practical ways to, you know, where you see that not being true in a particular situation for a particular child, being okay to call it out and being okay to be able to strategize and work on a way to, um, yeah, um, to address that for a particular child. I don't know. Sorry, that was, it was a great question. I don't know. It's a great I question. I, I think it was a, a great answer too, Natalie. <laughs> I think I'm I'm ancient enough to remember when Australia ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And at that point, back in 1990, there was a lot of debate around whether the rights of the child would undermine the rights of the parent or the rights of the teachers. And I think we're still a bit stuck in that kind of thinking. And I think, you know, for, for parents and for teachers, I think we assume that most people go into teaching because they care about children and young people. They want to support them. And that convention is the best advocacy tool that we have as adults to work on behalf of children, to work with children, to listen to children and to promote their rights and interests. And I think, you know, I would love to see that kind of conversation being had. You know, the convention is in no way divisive. It's about how we can support our children in the way we want to and the way we should. Mm. I'm just checking the Q&A. We're coming to a a close, um, Natalie. There's there's one question that I really did want to ask you. So I'll slip that in as, as we finish. Mm-hmm. And as we've been talking, um, I've been thinking about that amazing work that, um, that June Oscar has been leading as the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner, um, mm-hmm. and particularly the implementation framework for the Women's Voices Project. And you mentioned Annie June's work earlier. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that, that really struck me as so powerful is that that framework defines a vision for First Nations gender justice and equality. And it sets out the systems changes that are needed and the different ways of working. And it begins by stating that the vision in the framework is not a Western mainstream conception of gender equality. Mm -hmm. And in particular, First Nations visions position individuals differently. And I'm just wondering, you know, the, the rights and the wellbeing of children and young people is central to all that you do. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering, is there a First Nations conception of rights and well-being that shapes your work and perhaps a vision that helps us to think differently and to bring about real systems change? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was a really important point, you know, point of difference um, in the Women's Voices report um, is it was, you know, just to be upfront and just reject that, you know, clarify actually for people, this is not the Western mainstream, you know, approach. But at the same time, it's not a a child rights approach is not at odds with that. Um, Because realistically, if we think about how we apply child rights approach, it's not to land us in a place where we have this argument about competing rights. So we apply a child rights approach in terms of acknowledging children individually and collectively as as rights holders. And then we imagine our responsibilities and our obligations as duty bearers, so as adults, as kin, as community members, as leaders of organisations or service providers in a very similar way 
to the way that we understand our obligations as Aboriginal people to, a, to one another. So I think it's that distinction around, you know, that while a lot of rights are expressed as individual entitlements and in, a, in, in this construct that is about the individual, we're approaching our work recognising the individual and collective rights of children and young people. And that part for me is how it's compatible with the approach that Annie June describes in the um, Women's Voices uh, report. So um, that and centering the people that are most impacted, like, you know, we, we can't use the vulnerability or, you know, um, you know, of our kids as an excuse not to centre them in decisions. And um, it's probably the most compelling reason why we should include them. So um, I think, yeah, I, I've got a lot of respect for Annie June. And, and I think that the potent, transformational potential of that particular framework um, is really a gift to this country. And um, it would be great to see it, um, you know, recognised and, and embraced um, as a way forward in a whole range um, of, you know, social policy problems yes. that we have. Mm -hmm. I think that framework and, and also the Uluru Statement from the Heart are gifts to this country that we should be humbly accepting. Um, no, they, they're so important. Now we're, we're at two o'clock, we're, we're going to have to wind up what I think has been an amazing conversation. I've really enjoyed hearing from you and learning from you, but I wonder is, is there a final message that you'd like to leave us with today? Um, oh, look, you know, I just, you know, I want to acknowledge that people give up their time to join these conversations and, and people, um, you know, are genuinely committed to the rights of, um, of our children and young people. And, um, and I just want to say it's hard, but it is worth it. And um, I just want to say thank you for, yeah, for spending some time with us. And I really want to encourage you to have a look at some of the incredible work that has been done by um, people at the QFCC. Um, I think it really articulates a different way to look at accountability um, for the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids. So, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Natalie, thank you so much. We'll, we'll put some links to, to that work on our website as well so people can, can follow through if, they, if they're not familiar with, with your website. Um, I, I, wanted, I also wanted to, to just also thank people for joining us today. You know, I think these conversations are, are so important to have. Um, and to remind people that the recordings of this webinar and, and all our other webinars in this series are available on our website. We'll be back later in this year, um, not too far away, but we're taking a, a few weeks break with more conversations. So please do keep an eye on our website um, or to subscribe to our newsletter if you want to keep up to date with what the centre's doing. We've got lots of exciting things happening this year, um, including we're, we're planning some of these webinars with children and young people who are part of advisory groups. So that's going to be really exciting. Um, mm -hmm. I also today wanted to thank Celia Vukovic, who is our research officer, who does an amazing job in actually making all of these things happen. But as we close, Natalie, thank you so much for joining us today. It's, it's been an incredible conversation. Um, thank you for the work that you're doing and the leadership that you provide. It's been a privilege today. Mm -hmm.